I have the book open on Kindle to fulfill going over specific uh, bits. Yeah, yeah. So, well, what I was thinking is we could go over the the whole thing as a like as a whole first, and then we could dive into the specific books and their specific plots and issues and, and things like that. So, but let's just talk in general first. So, how? Yeah, what was your overall? uh experience what's your overall judgment of the series I, hmm. uh it, in some kind of way it reminds me of the bible in the sense that it doesn't really work as a as a whole it has bits that work really well but there's not much cohesion i mean the, the hmm. cast is the same right but it doesn't like there's not this pathos that goes from the one thing that happens to the next one uh i mean it's almost an anti-story there isn't really a single narrative that runs through the whole series but on on the other hand there are themes that run through it yeah like yeah. the you know the question of life the universe and everything and obviously the characters tied together but it's also the themes tied together uh, and i think like I, I see it as it is science fiction. I, I don't want to like say that science fiction has to be something very specific, but it's in some ways more of um, an existential philosophy book than a science fiction book. I mean, if you were trying to read it as pure science fiction, it would be a terrible uh, it would be terrible as pure science fiction because the science and technology are totally unbelievable. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if science fiction is supposed to be, let's imagine some science or technology, you know, some premise that, you know, might be plausible, or at least we can, you know, just speculate yeah. about something and then see what the implications of that are. So set the premises, some scientific or technological premise, then explore the implications of it. That That's like pure science fiction. And in, in this, it's more like a, it, well, it's like a random journey through a space of ideas. But that kind of fits the overall theme of the book, which is, or of the series, which is hitchhiking, which is randomness, which is nihilism, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, it really is like an extended uh, meditation on nihilism in a way. Yeah, I like it's, it's very easy to see, especially at the beginning, uh, that it's mostly written as comedy. Like the, the themes don't really start very strong. It's more about like um, almost situational comedy, right? It, it isn't too far removed from like what's the deal with like airplane meals or something, right? So basically, yeah. find those things. <laughs> There's a lot of that in it, yeah. You, you find things that, uh, when removed from context, have a lot of comedic potential, right? And then you like poke and prod the ways in which they break. I think that's kind of like I, I don't think um, the author really aimed as high as uh, philosophy, and that is what makes it actually a very good philosophy book. He just went for like like throwing stuff at the wall, right, and saying, "Okay, so this idea works like this. Now, how do we break it?" And that's uh, I like I wouldn't really call it um, science fiction uh, whatsoever. Because there's, there's no intent in building the setting. Like, it, it is not cohesive. It is not building a world. And it is, and the characters, sure, they're there, but they're like the every man. Yeah, I think you you hit on something there, which it does sort of go through all the books that he'll take something and then try to break it. So almost everything that he creates, he has to break. Right. right. Every Every world, every like moral principle or anything that comes up that's sort of good or works or anything that's working has to be broken. Right. right. It's uh, kind of interesting that way. But, but yeah, I see it as not, not pure, purely within any genre, but as combining science fiction, satire, uh, existential philosophy. Like in some ways it's a bit like Sarge or, you know, the Camus, the stranger. So it's even surrealist in a way. He was influenced by Monty Python. He was a writer for Doctor Who, so he got some of the ideas from those 
uh, you know, British uh, weird, weird humor slash science fiction. Right. But but he certainly made it his own into his own thing. I just want to say a little bit about where he got the idea. At least I read this, I think, in the notes in one of the books that he was hitchhiking around Europe in the 1970s. Oh, right. And one night he was, you know, drunk, whatever, lying in a vacant field, staring up at the stars. And he was hitchhiking around Europe with a guidebook, you know, some kind of European guidebook type thing, travel book. Yeah. And he, yeah. he started thinking, what if, uh, you know, I was hitchhiking around the galaxy and what would a book, you know, a guidebook to the galaxy be like? And it, so it really, the, the, the concept of hitchhiking plays a role in it that it kind of sets up the basic theme, which is a random journey and randomness. And yet at yeah. the same time, it isn't random. But everything kind of tied, you know, ends up being tied together. Coincidences are not just random events. They sort of link the characters and link the events in the story and all that. Which is, again, if you were reading this as a, a real science fiction book, you wouldn't really enjoy that. You would think, well, he's just using randomness as a, you know, a deus ex machina, a right, get, out of right. get out of jail free card. I can, you know, save them after they get thrown into space by just, you know, improbability or something, right? Right, right. But 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 if you just go with it, if you accept that that he's doing this uh, in order to sort of tie everything together with randomness, then it kind of works, I think. So anyway, sorry, I went off on a digression. But you were starting to talk about uh, the um, characters. Right, right. So the easiest character to to describe is obviously Arthur Dent. He's just like the everyman. He he grows increasingly disgruntled by all of the things that are going by. I think it is a, on his return to uh, a parallel version of Earth at so long and thanks for all the fish, mm-hmm. when he describes himself as like ragged in all the kinds of ways that being way too many times lost in a planet whose name you don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> like that's it, yeah he's the everyman character he's like the bilbo baggins you know the the ordinary person who gets thrown into a bizarre adventure and has to cope with it psychologically and physically right and and do you see how uh, the character begins to like rebel into like he grows into nihilism he, he very obviously is not uh, philosophically inclined but he just grows into not caring much, just going for it. It's the greatest moment of nihilism is with the, the cricket uh, thing, when he, I think it is tosses or something, like the bomb that would destroy everything. <laughs> In oh, some yeah. kind of action uh, sequence that there is against the, the cricket a killer robot thing. Uh, you, you mean that scene where he has the bomb that's going to destroy everything, yeah. and he feels like he's sort of compelled to to, to go through with this event, to, <laughs> yeah. to like pitch it to the robot who will then hit it and then it will explode and destroy the universe. Right. But then of course he misses and then yeah, that's a good that is a great scene. But yeah, <laughs> no, he, he, you're kind of right. It is sort of about his descent into nihilism uh his kind of grudging descent into that even though obviously it's you know there's a lot of humor involved along the way it's you know, he, he's definitely there as a sort of the straight man even though he does deliver some one-liners and stuff he's mostly there as the butt of jokes and as the person the universe is playing a joke on him right in a way right right so he's almost yeah. like he's like Job in a way from the Bible. Uh, yeah, it is. I mean, he he becomes surprisingly uh, adept at coping with how weird things are uh, by the end. But yeah, I don't know. Like in, in a way, the different characters. So basically, uh, at the beginning of the book, you just get oh yeah, the galaxy is this whole thing that exists out there. And, and that entire thing 
uh, like most of the value systems that we have, right? Originally, they were like uh, gods care for us and build this planet for us. And and this planet that they built for us was like the center of the universe. And that's all that there is, right? And very, very mm-hmm. simple minded kind of thinking of like the entire universe as like a gift. God, God, that's God is people. number one, but we're number two. And it's all about, yeah, we're, we're, right. it's all about us. Yeah. Right. So then what we're doing right now is like, okay, we know that there's more stuff out there, but we are deciding that we are actually the the source of meaning and knowledge in the world. And and that's where the the more stupid bits of humanism come in. Or like, I don't know, I don't know if you've seen, but there's this Kurtz Gesagt video that says, oh, basically, yeah, uh, the whole world and universe exists only to to purify the souls of humans and and see if they are ever more given to empathy and bullshit like that. So basically, <laughs> I, I have to see this now. Send it to me. Oh yeah, it, it's called the egg. Kurzgesagt is a lot of art and horrible ideas, but it is ah, I'm, I'm pretty good at music if you ask me. I, I like the kind of psychedelic uh, space mm. music. So okay. Uh, yeah, I haven't. I think I've seen some. I've, I've heard that name before. I've seen something in my recommendations, but I don't think I've ever watched it. Yeah, it is like the best, um, the best propaganda for like feel good leftism that there is out there. They try not to be too um, political. So they normally are more uh, focused on science or like, oh, what it would be if we nuke the moon with a, yeah, a nuke that is as big as, I don't know, like Belgium or something. <laughs> kind of what if we, we fucking love science. Oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, sometimes their worldview shines through the videos and it's kind of, I don't know. Anyways, so mm. yeah, that's the, the point that I was saying is that we begin with a very simple conception of what the world is and what is our place in it. Now that we have been faced with more things that say that we are actually not at the center of it, and as a re- rejection from that reality, we have become even more self-involved with all of this humanism stuff. But basically, the Hitchhiker, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, operates on the complete opposite side of it where the whole galaxy exists and everybody that is already in the galaxy knows that they don't matter, that none of them are central. And and you see that in that in the fact that most of the alien uh, characters are either oblivious to the whole galaxy, so they're like pre-Arthur Dent, or they're already post-Arthur Dent and they're like Seyfood, uh, Beetle, whatever his name is, or... Uh, Abel Brox, yeah. Well, yeah. They, they tend to either be sort of hedonistic, uh, people who see the, uh, all meaning as residing within their subjectivity. And in that case, like Seyfood, Beetle Brox, they're very, not just... He's very egotistical, right? Everything is about him. Uh, yeah. I, I wanted to expand a bit on the point you were making about the um the the perspective that a, a lot of the t- there are a lot of jokes in the book about perspective like the total perspective vortex yeah or even the way at the very beginning they start talking about space is big really mind-bogglingly big so amazingly big you, you know that kind of thing uh to get you know basically taking you, people away from their little petty concerns and then viewing things from this higher perspective makes everything seem meaningless that comes up over and over again but then also he contrasts that with people's ability to focus in on their little petty concerns right like the restaurant at the end of the universe where they're sitting around dining and having you know silly (laughs) chit chat and stuff while the universe literally is is being destroyed around them but from their perspective it's just well it's you know it's just for our entertainment it's a show they're not well, thinking about yeah, that. And then there is also like this guy didn't invent invisibility, uh, like invisibility. He invented the someone else's problem field, which is right. exactly right. about that kind of thing. 
Yeah, he brings that up over and over again, that people, the sort of pettiness of people and their ability to focus in on their little issues and their blindness to the, to other people's problems and to the the context in which they exist, the universe as a whole. So, yeah, I know that, yeah, he does that very well. I mean, the total perspective vortex is, uh, you know, a yeah, good example it's, it's of that. A high point of the whole thing. If the idea plugged, of, yeah, if you're plugged into it and you see... If you're plugged into it, you see the totality of existence, and this utterly destroys you because you see that you're you're nothing, right? That that um, and of course, but but of course, the irony is that some guy did this just to annoy his wife, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so he obviously didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, it it is. Well, I mean, on, on, on that, there's a little bit of um, commentary on on the sexes and all, which I I would believe is completely. Uh, not intended by Douglas, who seems to be not much interested in talking about those topics. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's not interested in talking about topics specific to one side or the other. That's that's one of the things that is very refreshing. Like he's he's trying to say, oh, everybody is like this, and like for example, yeah. the Magrathians, like we can accomplish your every desire. And then the next sentence is, we are not proud of this. So you're like, well, a civilization that is already that technologically advanced has not done away with like shame and all of that kind of stuff. So it, it knocks down a lot of stuff like, oh, n- bad things in human life are just a consequence of not having a high enough tech level, which is like this gay automated space communism bullshit that you hear sometimes. Yeah. Like, it well, isn't he, like that he, at all. <laughs> There, there's a lot of satire about bureaucracy and technology. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's funny with the technology. He will always see the potential negative consequence of something. Like, you know, the idea of making robots that are kind of like have AI and are like humans, but then they get the human personalities. And so you have them being annoying or depressive or, you know, sulking in the elevators that refuse to work because they're – trapped in an existential crisis or or whatever oh, right poor um, Mark. <laughs> yeah and but let's talk about the characters a little bit and what they represent i mean marvin is an example of that right he's the i guess you could say he's a nihilist or a feudalist or something like that not entirely but you know he's got a very bleak outlook on life right right um we were talking earlier about Arthur Dent, and I think like Arthur Dent is almost like the, the linchpin, even though he is the most plain um, character. Most of the characters can be understood on on um, how far have they progressed through nihilism, being pre-Dent or post-Dent, right? And mm. the more you are post-Dent, the more that you have already made up your own set of beliefs and all, that you operate by and you normally are more like hedonistic or or you're like like the the bird people from one of the planets that he goes in for counsel uh, I, I don't know if you remember this one but basically well, the ones there are the uh, bird there are the bird people on yeah, planet star b who's who because their planet was destroyed by the shoe uh economic <laughs> disaster in which every all economic production became about shoes I mean, it's funny, just as an aside, a lot of the things in the book are kind of dated, like they refer back to fads of the 1980s and stuff like that, like digital watches and shoes, and running yeah. shoes. But um, but I'm, I think you might be talking about the another place, though, the, uh, uh, yeah, the well, monks or something the, the, that Arthur visits later. Yeah, I think it is in the last book, Mostly Harmless, right before he settles and becomes a, a sandwich maker. He goes to a place for counsel because he lost um, Fanny Church. Was was that her name? Yeah, Fen Fen Church or Fanny. Ah, Fen Church. Yeah. Okay. So he went somewhere, right? Yeah, and he went there for counsel because uh, he got into a pamphlet that that is the best place for uh, getting counsel in all of the universe. Yeah, it's, it's the monks or something. You're talking about the scene where somebody steps from the top of one pole to another. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly that. Okay. So, so basically, 
it is either they become hedonists and those are the ones that we understand or they become like the monks in this on, on top of these poles or, or like the guy that was given too much of the truth drug and in a trial and, and yeah. he became like the speaker of truths that break the universe or whatever the fuck like <laughs> uh basically something completely incomprehensible to us completely because they have already transcended so much beyond our normal cap uh, capacity for knowledge that it's difficult to even well no i think i know what you're saying i mean Part of it is that the truth will sort of destroy you. That's one of the ideas. And so the, the different characters have different attitudes toward it. Zaphon right. just has this incredible screen of egotism. You know, he's he thinks he's so amazing that and and so important that, you know, the vastness of the universe is nothing compared to him. Right. Ford is just like um, kind of an ex pragmatic acceptance his approach is just okay. That's just the way it is. I'm just living my life, doing my thing, whatever. Okay. Um, Marvin's uh, reaction is to become profoundly depressed, and Arthur is sort of struggling with it. He doesn't want to reject the truth. He doesn't want to just turn away from it. He's like trying to be earnestly engaged in the universe, but he's struggling with the truth and and trying to find the truth. So yeah, I mean he's the he's the seeker, right? He's the every man who goes out in search of I mean, partly in search of the truth, but to some extent, he just wants to get back home. I mean, that's the other aspect of this, that yeah. partly this is about losing your home and then never having that again, right? Like not losing your foundation. Nihilism is about losing your foundation. Yeah. And in a way, home is a metaphor for your foundation. And he loses his home at the very beginning. He loses his planet, his life, you know, everything kind of that he was connected to everything that gave his life meaning is now gone and that's another thing he has to struggle with like how do i find meaning now that everything that used to give my life meaning in an intuitive sense is now gone right um yeah and i, and I think like um probably it was meant originally just as a comedy and this guy was uh more of a device for getting laughs out of the reader than uh, an actual character. But I think I think that's the reason for why it starts as a comedy and it ends at a tra as a tragedy. Because basically all of the rage that Dent might have gone through that we didn't actually focus on at the time, because back then it was more of a uh, happy-go-lucky comedy, right? All of that uh, angst was then perfectly bottled up into the character of Randall Fryer. Uh, hmm. daughter. Yeah, yeah. And and you see like a mad rush of, of someone that has been abandoned in the universe and has no home and nobody to care for and is a complete bow of hatred she, almost. She, right, she deals with it by rejecting the universe, by being full of hatred and well in a way like the I mean the cricketers had a similar Response. Right, right. Their reaction to being shown the universe was, well, this has to go, right? <laughs> right. But um, yeah, but yeah, the random. Uh, but the cricketers have the excuse that they were engineered to be this way by the computer that wanted to build the, the weapon mm. to destroy the entire universe. I think. Well, I suppose the random also, in a way, was engineered by this. Um, oh you know, yeah, by the guide. By the guide, the new guide, the bird guide. Yeah. Yeah, but by the way, um, what do you think was the motivation for the guide? Because Ford points at it and says, okay, so uh, the guide was with me for some time and everything went peachy, but then I no longer am useful to the guide, so now the girl is useful to the guide. But the guide obviously has its own kind of intention <laughs> out there. So Yeah, what... I can't remember the... <laughs> Uh, let me the, see if I can find it. No, I I remember the story, but I I don't know if it's the the agent of like Hektar who wanted to destroy the universe or something like that. If there's still some kind of agency built into it that wants to destroy oh. the universe. Um, I I think. Hmm. But it's, it seems to want to bring about this end. Everything seems to be directed by it, right? And, I mean, this is another thing 
another one of the kind of contradictions that is built into the story that there's randomness, but the randomness actually has an underlying purpose. It's just not your purpose. Right. So you're a puppet, but what seems random to you is really the puppet strings being pulled in a complex way that you're unaware of, right? So Adams plays with this idea of randomness, not not really being random, and uh, and and this this version of the guide is sort of uh, omnipotent in a way because it it arranges things by moving around in this kind of multiverse. But I don't remember the motivation of it. I don't remember that. Like what yeah, was I, the? It, it isn't like I, I got to the page that it is talking about. Uh, because if you've got the guy to saying that you're the one it's working for, everything went swimmingly smooth for me from then on. Up until the moment I came up against the totty with a rock, and that'd be random. Then bang, I'm his dream out of the loop. I mean, it seems like its goal is sort of an effulist. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy becomes an effulist uh, universe yeah. destroyer, right? I, I, I was thinking of that. It is either that or. Um, or cohesion. Well, I'm, I mean, co uh, cohesive on like trying to eliminate um, things that are improbable or time anomalies. Because if, if you're like, imagine that you're able to see entire multiverse, uh, like the general mishmash thing that they uh, name now and then, mm -hmm. you'd be very capable of seeing the wrinkles in it or the places where things are just. Uh, crumpled or together and the story has made earth to be one of these places so maybe it isn't destroying all life but he's trying to like normalize all things i don't know like all of this yeah that, that could be it too it's trying to get i mean it, it could also be that the vogons were the who finally wanted to get rid of earth from all the timelines i mean that's another one of the jokes in the book that that it pokes fun at academics and and academic philosophy that uh the earth was a, we, we haven't mentioned this yet, but the Earth was a, a supercomputer designed to calculate the question to the ultimate answer. Right. Right. That whole joke about you know, kind of the silliness of um, philosophy. But this is a good example of how Adams brings in serious issues through humor. Like he brings up this question, what is the purpose of life? But he doesn't say that the machine is trying to figure out what the purpose of life is. He says in more vague terms. That people don't really know what the question is. So they just ask a computer, do this, you know, right, tell us right. what the big, tell us the answer to the big question. And the computer thinks about it for whatever, a million years, then says, oh, the answer is 42. And then they're like, well, wait <laughs> yeah. a minute, <laughs> what? And, and he's like, well, I think your problem is you don't know what the question was. And then he, right, he can't, right. he can't answer the, he doesn't know what the question is, but somehow he got the answer. But anyway, then he builds the earth, uh, or designs the earth, the earth is then created to calculate the ultimate question. And there are interests who want to destroy the earth because their, their business is confusion. Their business is that nobody knows the answer. So that like psychologists and philosophers and religious people, whatever they need. Right. Right. Confusion. One of the philosophers says we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's stuff like that. Anyway, so, yeah, it could – I'd have to go back and reread that book, but it could be that the goal was to eliminate this. Well, um, yeah, just now that I'm looking through the conversation between Dent and Ford, um, I, I already saw it. So, yeah, it, it was the Vogons. The Vogons contracted the scientist at the guide in order to build the guide so that it reversed temporal engineered the earth out of existence because it was i mean the vogons were probably paid off by this uh the consortium of philosophers <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah okay so something like that anyway it, it doesn't really matter because the plot does not make yeah. sense it would never stand up <laughs> to an analysis of its logic but the it doesn't really have to because that's not the point of it um yeah, but okay. the, I mean, it, it keeps looping in on itself. Like it, it is, it, it it isn't logical, but it is neat. <laughs> yeah, it does kind of. I I don't know. You said it's not coherent, but I do think that it is in a way coherent. That all these different things do kind of all fit together. I, I they probably do on a second read more than they do on a first. 
So for example, like and the bit that I have the most press that I just read was the end. It's funny for me. I think it is a, a point that uh, Dent says like a bad word or something in a conversation with um, the Magrathian that uh, helped them save the stuff. Slardy Bard fast? Yeah, Slardy Bard. Okay, yeah, I I never said those. <laughs> big sure, names sure, yeah. <laughs> Slardy whatever. Uh, he said something like, that wouldn't be too good or something. And then there was a time anomaly that transported that word to like a meeting between two word chiefs trying to negotiate a peace deal or something. And apparently in their language, that was the worst thing that you could ever say. And then there was this huge war effort that apparently was all going to be horrible and going for forever because both of these cultures were were cultures that couldn't stand disrespect like that. Uh, but the problem is that they made a problem in the calculation scale. So when they yeah, sent they, their fleet, uh, it was uh, ingested by a small dog, and that was right, that. Right, right. I mean, that's just a typical absurd. Uh, this is like a Monty Python sketch, you know. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's where you see the Monty Python inspiration. Right. But, but, um, but the funny thing is the reason that um, Tricia left uh, random was to report on this very war. <laughs> <laughs> oh really? Oh okay. Yeah. yeah, no, he he does bring bring things back and he ties the things together in a way. Like he he doesn't just just go. He doesn't use his plot devices just as a license to just say anything happens. He does try to tie things together, tie them back to the themes of the book and the main characters and the various plot lines. Right. Um so I think there is a kind of coherence to it, but it's not like uh, it's certainly not a traditional narrative by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah, if if I had to describe it, it's like like a big loop of yarn. The beginning and the end are connected, but it's made into a huge tangled mess. And yeah, and, yeah, you probably have to read it a couple of times until you manage to fit. Uh, well, disentangle, lines. yeah, disentangle yeah. the plot lines, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I also really liked, um, I think it is at the beginning of the second book, uh, when you get uh, Dent interacting with a girl that says, oh, I am an economist. I am here for, like, my... She basically shows herself to be basically an intellectual prostitute that tells people that have a lot of money why that is good and tries to make them feel good by word alone. But all of the, <laughs> the scene frames her to be basically a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> Where is that? When did that happen? In which book? I think it is in the second one at the beginning. Oh, huh. okay. Well, me... it'll probably come back to me. I don't know. There's so many different... Uh, it sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah, it is like describing uh, a city in which... Um, uh, I don't know, like bass player, uh, like bass players are basically two cents. So if they don't play the lick right, they just get shot and killed. Oh, this is Ford. I think Ford sitting on a doorstep talking to a girl, uh, a prostitute in a in. I think this is in the last book. Is it? I think so, or maybe in the second to last. I I, I think. I think. Yeah, he's talking to a prostitute or something like that, and she it's says, "Yeah, my job was to get together with uh, fan church." So, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't remember, but it'll, it'll come back to me. So, do you want to go through the books in order and just talk a bit about the plot and the? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of it is already starting to get hazy for me, and if you haven't read the book in some time, uh, surely for you too. So, I think it helps us both. Well, I just went through, I didn't make it all the way to Mostly Harmless, but I went through the other books and I made some notes about oh, the plot. Nice. So we can probably go through that and use that as a structure and then you know, okay. go into detail on certain things. But a lot of it we've already kind of touched on. We touched on a lot of the plot points, but this will help give it more structure, I guess. All right, so we, we start out with Arthur Dent, the everyman character, as you said. And he's very English. He's a nice guy, but he's like he's somewhat cynical. He's not like a, you know, 
a passionate believer in anything. He's sort of a, an agnostic, you could say, right? Kind yeah. of moral agnostic, but not a not a philosophical nihilist. Just he's just minding his own business, doing his little thing, living in the English countryside. And then he discovers his house is going to be knocked down to make way for a bypass. And right. This is the, you know, the one of the metaphors of the book that, you know, mindless bureaucracy destroying things for no for no reason yeah. and so he tries to stop this event from taking place and then his friend ford comes along and ford i think is somewhat based on the character of doctor who he's an mm -hmm. alien from beetlejuice and but he's the street smart survivor type and he, he comes along and says to ford or and says to arthur we gotta go, we gotta get off this planet right so it's, it's about mm -hmm. to be blown up uh, so anyway, so Arthur is in his his dressing gown. He just woke up, hasn't um, dressed or anything, and they end up, you know, I'll cut, I won't go through all the details, but uh, they end up escaping from the Earth just before it is destroyed, in the same way that Arthur's house was going to be destroyed to make right. way for an arbitrary, pointless, uh, so-called hyperspace bypass, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> and, and this this brings them. Uh, you know, out of this casts Arthur adrift. His whole world is gone. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't super attached to it anyway. Like if he had had children or a wife or something, then it wouldn't have worked as well because he would have been in this absolute misery. But right, he wasn't right. that attached to his home, so he's cast out of it. And he's not dispassionate about it, but he finds it hard to even really like find a connection to that event. And right, right. Instead of closing himself off, like being uh, living through the misery of all of it, he's just trying to cope with the changing environment. Yeah, he's trying to adapt, but he's also just trying to grasp it. Like, what? Or, you know, how, I don't get it. How can this this can't happen? So <laughs> he can only he can only feel about it when he thinks that his his like neighborhood is gone, or like a little store that he went to is missing, or something like that. He can't really right. grasp the, the absence of the earth. But uh, anyway, then they are they're on a Vogon spaceship, so it's not long until they get into trouble, they get captured. Then there's the famous poetry reading scene, which is really just making fun of bad poetry, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but in a very in a very good way, right? Like the idea that listening to somebody else's poetry can be torture is actually very <laughs> true, right? And they, yeah. and, yeah. and and this is a good example of of Douglas Adams using technology. Uh, you know, imaginary, amusing technology like simile dampers and, you know, whatever, intensifiers. So they get plugged into devices that intensify the experience of hearing bad poetry. Right, right. And uh, they get tortured for a while. And uh, in spite of their best efforts to placate the, the Vogon captain, they get thrown into space. And so they're going to die. But then, by a miracle, they are rescued by the improbability right. drive, the infinite improbability drive spaceship, which is based on this obviously absurd notion yeah, yeah, yeah. that yeah, that I if you sort of heart of gold, yeah, the heart of gold, yeah, and it's based on this notion that if you you can sort of create generate improbability, and that will then make things happen that you want to happen, even though obviously this is absurd because improbability is not control. <laughs> it's randomness, but you know he so he mixes he always mixes these ideas together, right? So he they, they get taken aboard the improbability drive spaceship, and that's where they meet Zaphod, uh, who's another guy from Beetlejuice who knows Ford, and mm -hmm. Trillian who had met Arthur previously, right? And Marvin, they they first get introduced to Marvin, <laughs> who is trudging along through the corridors of the ship doing his job in a depressed way because he's got this genuine people personality that was programmed into him <laughs> yeah it, it is it is pretty funny like marvin on its own does not really work you have to compare marvin with the other machines which are incredibly pleased by um by doing the tiny little task that they're given Right, the but happy I, I doors, the, the doors that are thrilled to open and shut. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and there's a little bit of um I mean, I, I'm again skipping a little bit, 
but uh, when Ford assaults the offices of the guide way, way later, he basically manages to get in and out, uh, mostly unscathed by the fact that he gets a little like um, defense drone and hijacks with a clip <laughs> the reward. Well, he reverses the pleasure and pain centers on it. Yeah. Right. Or no, he makes it happy. He just short circuits its pleasure center or something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, Douglas Adams does this many times in there. He points out the arbitrariness of emotion yeah, and that he, it's just a mechanism. Yeah, I, I think he's very keen on both perspective and also motivation because also motivation is something that comes up both in the bull, uh, bulldozer driver that goes over. like He has no motivation to do this thing that he's doing because he has no... He has been fed no real reason for why he has to do it. His motivation is just in doing whichever order was given to them. And it is kind of funny that then the Vogons are basically the, the inter, like, intergalactic version of this very same character. Yeah. All these yeah. people that get given orders shouting and, and then take pleasure, uh, pleasure in shouting other orders at people that are below them in the hierarchy. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, he does that I, a lot. He satirizes the pettiness of emotion and and the sort of uh, you know ad hoc and arbitrary nature of it. But yeah, right. the doors the doors that are just thrilled to open and close. It is a really funny little bit, right? <laughs> they made they made the yeah. doors just so excited to open and close, but then <laughs> Marvin's all depressed and just trudging along doing his job. But <laughs> he hates it. He hates every moment of it. Yeah. Right. Um, and then there's the shipboard computer that has like two personalities that they can switch between. But anyway, oh, right. so yeah, there's a lot of humor in that. Anyway, so then they, they end up on the, the Heart of Gold spaceship, mm -hmm. which looks like a running shoe because this is the 80s when running <laughs> shoes were a big thing. So he never misses an opportunity to make fun of something. Wow. And then they, they go on Zaphod's big adventure. So now... Arthur and Ford have no purpose. They really have, they're doing nothing, right? So Zaphod has some goal. He's doing something. They just get swept up in his, by his motivation, by his right, right. adventure, whatever he's trying to do. I mean, he doesn't even know why he's trying to do it. That's another one of those motivational jokes that he, okay. when he was younger, he did surgery on his brain to... Ah, to forget about something that, yeah, he knew. To, to, to make him do things, but not know the reason he's doing them. So, uh, but he has this desire to find the planet Magrathea. Yeah. And they go there, and then there's some shenanigans. They get attacked, and Arthur saves the day by turning on the yeah. improbability drive. Somehow a whale appears. A whale and a pot of flowers, and later on, that, and this is a good example of him tying things back, that the pot of flowers was Arthur's... Uh, yeah, nemesis. <laughs> you know, nemesis, or maybe Arthur is the nemesis of that pot of flowers. But yeah, it is. It is pretty uh, funny <laughs> the way that that like uh, on that point, I think he's just like fully seasoned, almost without any kind of restraint. It's it's really kind of funny. Like going in, I was actually getting up to Magnusia. I was not enjoying one bit of it because of how fast and loose he's playing with the setting. So it didn't mm. make any sense. And, and how he was using the characters basically as devices was infuriating me because other characters, other writers, right, they they try not to be this overt about it. So basically, yeah, it's a very different, it's written in a very different way from a typical story where you you set up the premises and you tr then try to make everything believable Whereas in this book, he just doesn't care. It's just like anything that I feel like making happen will happen. Right, right. Like it, it is almost like a meta story. The story doesn't make much sense when you try to really treat it as a story. But when you take it as, oh, yeah, like I was at a bar having a pint or something. And then some guy came up to me having had already a few pints too many and said, I'm going to tell you. An incredible story. So it's it's that kind of vibe. <laughs> yeah. No. You, yeah. You're right. You have to take a step back from it. You can't you can't read it like an ordinary science fiction story. But uh, 
so anyway, yeah, so the, the pot of flowers that falls down to the planet and is destroyed thinks to itself, oh, no, not again. And that <laughs> that turn, that comes back later in one of the books. Right, right. Anyway, so, yeah, they, they manage to – the improbability drive turns uh, the nuclear missiles into a whale and a pot of flowers, allowing mm-hmm. them to escape from certain death. And then they go down and land on the planet. And um, it's there that – Arthur discovers he meets Slardy Bartfast mm-hmm. because the others go off on a journey and Arthur stays behind. And then this mm-hmm. guy, Slardy Bartfast, shows up and says, come, Earthman, you know, you must come with me. He's like this prophet slash professor type figure. Right. And so Arthur goes with him and then he teaches him about the the origin of the Earth, that the Earth was created by mice, by interdimensional mice <laughs> who... <laughs> were the projection into our dimension of uh, of higher dimensional beings who created the earth to find the ultimate and the, the ultimate question the question to the ultimate answer <laughs> of life the universe and everything so that's where it gets introduced the 42 right, right. joke and all that stuff and um, then the mice you know have are having dinner put out a nice dinner for the the characters who eventually all show up and then they drop the bomb that they want to buy Arthur's brain and, um, you know, extract the ultimate question from it. Right. And and so then, uh, of course, they manage to escape from the mice. And, uh, and, and Marvin plays a role in this because Marvin uh, – or, oh, no, then some police come to catch Zaphod for having stolen the Heart of Gold. Oh, okay. But, but – um, the, the police are from some planet. They need special suits to survive. And Marvin depresses their ship's oh, right, computer right, right. to the point where the ship commits suicide, causing the police to also die when their spacesuits no longer function. Right. And um, it's not the last time that Marvin saves the day. But anyway, yeah. so they, they managed to escape. But this is sort of – this has set up a number of plot lines like the, the question – it has um, well, it's introduced all the main characters, and we've got the question problem and the general yeah. theme and of the mice, book. and also I think the, the dolphins are referred to as also the second most intelligent uh, they, thing. They might have been mentioned, yeah. So it's it's but the but the idea of what the Earth's purpose was and right. all, all that stuff is kind of introduced, and then the book just sort of ends in the middle, really. Right, and the next thing I remember is they're already at a restaurant. Well, well, hold on. No, it's not. So the, when the book ends, they're just saying we should get some food. Zaphon says, you guys hungry? And they say, oh, yep, right. we're hungry. And then he says, okay, well, hold on. We're going to go for a bite to eat at the restaurant at the end of the universe. So he actually says that at the end of that book. That's where the book ends. Uh, and in the next book, they get attacked by the Vogons. So the next book begins with them being attacked by Vogons when they're out in space. Mm-hmm. And there's kind of a weird scene in there where Zaphon has a seance to contact the spirits of his ancestors. Oh, his grandfather, right. or something like that. I, I do find it a little bit annoying that Douglas Adams brings in so many different things, like ghosts and all that, which don't really fit into the overall point of the book but i i still stand by the fact that this is not science fiction well no no (laughs) it doesn't well i'm not i'm not being too picky here but it's just he throws in yet another thing right so the ghosts somehow instead of like instead of the improbability drive saving the day it's the ghosts who save the day and so zaphod and marvin then go off on an adventure while the others kind of disappear from the story for a while yeah Zaphod and Marvin then go and end up on Frogstar B. Zaphod ends up on whatever the planet is where the well, – he's, he's there to meet Zarni Whoop. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but – He's there to what? He's there to meet this guy named Zarni Whoop who is, who is like part of this plan that he formally came up with before he did surgery oh, right, on his right, brain right. to forget it. Right. It had to do with – um, like 
what Find I remember man. from this whole arc is he gets into the the absolute uh, perspective vortex thing, and he gets told that he's the best thing ever because he apparently he is in an entire universe constructed just for him. Right, right. So what happens is, yeah, he goes into this building where uh, he's supposed to meet the man named Zarni Whoop, and um, some guy takes him up to the office and then says, I'm only here for one reason, to tell you when you leave this room, go out the window, not the door. And oh. so he's in Zarni Whoop's office waiting for him, but he's not there. And then the building is attacked by Frogstar fighters who then carry it off into space. They basically wow. destroy the bottom part of the building. They lift it off into space, and then they crash land the building on Frogstar B. And then Zaphod goes out the window, and it turns out late. Well, I maybe shouldn't give it away now, but he goes out the window, and then he has to climb down the building to the ground. And that's where he meets – I think he sees the, the bird people who live there. Yeah. This is a cursed planet. Frogstar B is a cursed planet cursed because its economy went into this shoe spiral and was destroyed yeah. because you know it became all about shoes and I that's where he an infinitim uh, effort was uh, related to that yeah well so he meets some ghost there's another ghost in this one who's like a disembodied mind who guides him down to the vortex right he goes into the vortex which is supposed to destroy him utterly because he is going to be plugged into this machine that is, extrapolates the entire universe from a piece of fairy cake. <laughs> and seeing the enormity of the universe is supposed to utterly destroy his ego and leave right. him just a, a shell of a human. But he comes out of it. He's like, oh, man, I'm, <laughs> it just showed me that I'm the greatest thing in the universe. And he eats <laughs> the fairy cake and just wanders off. And, yeah, later... It's discovered that going out the window of the office put him into the alternate universe that was like Zarni. I think that he went to like the Hitchhiker's Guide offices, and I think Zarni was a, a journalist or a writer for the guide. And he, but he would do his research by exploring an artificial universe. Ah, oh, right, so right, right. All this time, Zephod has been in an artificial universe that Zarni Wood created just for him to set up this whole thing. And so that's why he wasn't destroyed by the total perspective vortex. Right. Because ironically, this universe is all about him. <laughs> but if, if it was the real frog star B, then he'd be utterly destroyed. Yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, I really, is... so just, just, uh, I know that we're doing kind of the thing, but I really like the idea of the absolute perspective vortex. It's such a, a keen kind of like um, human psychology basically the author already betrays oh yeah this perspective stuff that i'm making fun of and this motivation stuff that i'm making fun of you can make fun of it all of it that you need that you want but you still need it to be alive and be functional so in a way most of the novel is just the onslaught of, of truth and perspective and and showing how vain and stupid motivations are on the characters and seeing how they like take the abuse kind of yeah he's well it's like he he never creates anything that he doesn't also destroy like e even the total perspective vortex gets destroyed in a way right. but um yeah it's a brilliant idea that's i mean that's why i named the discord server frogstar b because i really like that thought experiment <laughs> um all right so then anyway zaphod wanders off and he ends up finding a spaceport. I guess he's looking for a way to get off the planet. Right. And it's in that spaceport where he discovers the spaceship that has been sitting there for like a million years ever since the planet's civilization collapsed because it's waiting for lemon-soaked paper napkins to be delivered. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, this is a great, a great um, satire on blind rule obedience, you know, just right, right. The, the computer is just like, well, I have to tick off this item on my list of to-do list. I have to get the lemon-soaked paper napkins. And, uh, you know, I'll just have to wait until civilization reemerges <laughs> and some some new civilization can manufacture lemon-soaked paper napkins. And so the spaceship has put its passengers into suspended animation while it's waiting for the lemon-soaked paper napkins. 
And uh, and then, of course, Zarni Whoop was sitting on that spaceship waiting for Zaphod all the time. <laughs> um, but somehow Zaphod manages to extricate himself from Zarni Whoop. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, he had the, it turns out he had the Heart of Gold in his pocket. It had shrunken down to a little model, and it was in his pocket. And so then uh, it expands, and he runs on board, and then he says to the computer on the spaceship, send us to the nearest place to eat. And then, boom, they all disappear, and that's when when they sort of wake up in Millie Ways, the restaurant at the end of the universe. Right? That's So it took that much... Um, and it took that complicated a plot line to get them to the restaurant. <laughs> I, I mean, a, another thing to point out is that this was written to be a radio series. Yeah. So yeah, each yeah. like each episode had to contain enough drama to make it interesting. So yeah, it's it's very punchy. Like um, I, I noticed that I didn't really have to reread what I was already uh, that I had already covered. And I and I read it on bursts. Like I I read maybe the first two books in like over two months, and then I read the rest pretty close. And then I I left mostly Hamlet's unread for like four months in a row, and then completed it last last week. So, but I I still was not like I I was not frustrated because I um, what was happening was too related to things that had happened earlier. I was going to say too complex, but no, yeah, incredibly complex things do happen. It's incredibly complex, but you're just sort of swept along by it. You don't have to worry too much about what happened before. Right, right. And there are no references to things that happened earlier that are specific references. So that's the reason for why figuring out how everything ties together is probably going to be horrible because things are not named the same way. Yeah, well, I mean, they do, they do, like I said, they do kind of fit together in a way. There are references that go back, but because at least the first two books were written as a series of radio episodes, they do have that more disjointed format, whereas the later books were more, are more book-like. Yeah. Um, anyway, so they, they end up at the restaurant at the end of the universe. And I absolutely love this idea because to me, this is kind of like where we are in a way. Like it contrasts this huge, profound event and this event that has philosophical implications, right? Because if the total universe is destroyed, what's the point of doing anything? So it takes that and it contrasts it with a restaurant, which is like almost in its own way absurd. Like the little, you know, the petty, it's the most petty thing in a way that people do. They go to a a restaurant, have a nice meal. There are all these little kind of pointless, um, you know, rules of etiquette and, and they make a small talk. And I think Adams sees absurdity in the whole, just the idea of a restaurant and the way people act in restaurants. And so he, he has this setting where they're in a restaurant about to have a nice little meal, but the restaurant is located in time at the end of the universe when the universe is collapsing on itself, and this event is being used as entertainment, right? So yeah. they're they're selling, they're they're they've commoditized the very end of time, which I thought was you know like there's a lot of a lot of great satire built into that that setting. Yeah. Uh, I, I I like a lot in a way that it is like, okay, so if you notice that the universe was going to die anyways, so what would you do then? And like, this guy is, has really, I don't know, he, he's like a little savant or he's actually like that intelligent to have already thought it all out in the way of, okay, well, what would I do? Well, if everything's going to die anyways, I have fun. <laughs> and what would put on a, a pre-killer show? <laughs> well, everything imploded. So <laughs> it kind of makes it, it makes sense, but it makes well, sense in a kind of like post-human kind of way. Yeah, well, it, I think a lot of it is about just showing the petty again, the pettiness of people, how they can take something like the end of the universe and turn it into entertainment, and you yeah. know just 
mostly they're focused on their dinner, their conversation, the drinks. Oh, but the universe is ending outside. You know, we could take a look at that for a while and then go back <laughs> to our conversation. You know, I mean, it's just so it is so funny, right, that they're they're so, you know, that's so narrowly focused on our own little concerns. And uh, anyway, so so they're there in the restaurant having a meal and the, the entertainer is doing his little show, making his little jokes and stuff. And um, this is when the animal that wants to be eaten is introduced. <laughs> the, di- right. the, the dish of the day comes out. And hey, this is another great like bit of, I don't know what to call it, satire. It's like philosophical humor. Like the question of the, the morality of eating an animal, the issues involved in, well, we're killing something to eat it. You know, do our concerns as does our hunger or our desire for tasty food justify the treatment of this animal (laughs) and adams solves this by saying that they bred the animal or they genetically engineered the animal to want to be eaten right this is another joke about motivation yeah the animal wants to be eaten so it's all excited about killing itself and you know it's trying to sell them on oh you should try some of my you know my back and or how about a you know a nice stew of my yeah, <laughs> of my leg or whatever, right? Right, and, uh, right. And, and, and this Arthur, horrifies them. Right, people. and then the the irony is that this horrifies him. This idea that the sentient, intelligent animal that wants to be eaten, you know, that he would eat it, he can't stomach that idea. Right. And, and the animal kind of jokingly says, "Don't he's he'll nip off and shoot himself, and don't don't worry, I'll be very humane." Kind of wink, wink, <laughs> nudge, nudge, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it almost feels like I don't know. Um, that reminded me of like, am I being accessory to someone else's sexual thing? <laughs> like, it's it's kind of bad. <laughs> I don't know. Like, ah, it, it it feels perverse. Yeah, in a kind of way, I think the the shock of being in that situation there, embodied in Arthur, is part of it. It's like. In a kind of way, I think this is um, an address directly to people who are like vegans or vegetarians, basically saying to them, even if I perfectly solved a new problem, you still wouldn't like it. And that says more about you than about the problem, right? Yeah, well, I, I don't think he's being political about it. It's, it's, he's creating an absurd situation in which Arthur is refusing to eat the animal. The animal is trying to reason him into eating the animal, like the animal, saying, "Oh well, there's nothing wrong with eating me, you know. You should," and and he doesn't agree with Arthur's notion of having a salad. He's very right. offended by that. Anyway, <laughs> it just that was a very funny bit, and it's kind of it's again where he takes philosophical issues, turns them into humor, doesn't really doesn't preach, doesn't get on the soapbox. He just yeah. exposes the absurdity and the the um kind of arbitrariness of everything. Like, what if we just engineered animals that wanted to be eaten, right? <laughs> anyway, uh, so they have their meal and various other things happen, and then they are going. They leave by stealing a spaceship. Oh, right. and in the car park, and we've forgotten about Marvin. Marvin was left behind on Frogstar B right. uh, when Zephod went there, and, and it turns out that the restaurant at the end of the universe is located on Frogstar B only billions of years in the future. Yeah. So poor poor Marvin has been waiting for billions of years on the planet, <laughs> and he's now Our working existence. as a janitor in the car park. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, he's like, oh, the first million years were pretty bad. Then the, the next million years were pretty terrible also. <laughs> and so he's... He's there to uh, insult them, basically, and you know, for not caring about him and abandoning him. But yeah, then, and, uh, and the reason that they got to that restaurant is because geographically it was the closest one, which is the the, the, the mind numbing bit about it. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that doesn't make any sense, of course, because in space there's no fixed reference frame. But again, this is not like trying to be serious science fiction. Right, so, right. So anyway, they Marvin is there and he helps them to steal a spaceship, which they do. Now the whole gang is together again. Mm-hmm. 
but the spaceship turns out to be uh, part of a rock band's uh, a stunt ship that's going to crash into a sun a few right. million years in the past, I think. Mm -hmm. And so then they're desperately trying to escape from it. And they can escape by randomly teleporting out of it. Except, of course, Marvin has to stay behind to operate the controls. So after waiting for billions of years, poor Marvin is now just going to crash into the sun and be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And uh, these guys teleport out randomly, more or less. Mm -hmm. And Zaphod and Trillian end up back with uh, Zarniwoop on the Heart of Gold. Okay. Whereas Ford yeah. and Arthur um, end up on Olga Frinchem Ship B, which is going to prehistoric Earth, although they don't know that. Right. right. That's, that, that's the joke. And right, so they, they end up in this in this ship, which is like hideously decorated, and then they hear some tramping of feet, and so they hide, and a bunch of joggers go by in jogging suit and track suits. And um, this is the 80s again. <laughs> it's, it's another 80s joke, but they dis they discover that they're on a ship. Well, the the joke is that the, the bigger joke is that this planet Golga Frinchum engineered a fake crisis as an excuse to send yeah. away <laughs> yeah, a useless third of its population. <laughs> all, all the all the you know the hairdressers, the the account executives. Yeah, you know, all these people doing these kind of petty, silly jobs, and it sent them. Types, yeah. Yeah, the I guess they had a surplus of uh, they had an overproduction of of middlemen, and so they got rid of all their managerial yeah. types. But, and by the way, uh, you didn't comment on this. Marvin comments that he actually has already read into the brain patterns of uh, Dent. Oh right, the, right. The ultimate question. But he's not able to say it because the moment that he brings it up is right up during the moment that he cannot speak because he has to teleport everybody else before right. they, they crash into the sun. Right. So basically, this entire thing, the ultimate question does not get treated as an ultimate question by the author. It's just like, oh yeah, this, this tidbit that you don't even get to hear or the characters do not even get to... To, to, well, it could to never be revealed to, because right? if it were revealed, then it, yeah, it would ruin the whole, the whole book, right? I mean, it has to be this mystery. There, there can't really be an ultimate question or an ultimate answer, right? right? Because if there is, the book does not make sense. But anyway, so yeah, then, so, but that's a good point. That does happen just before they they disappear. But then uh, they discover Ford and Arthur discover that they are on this ship with all these misfits who have been kicked off a planet and sent to colonize another one. Mm -hmm. And their ship has been programmed to crash land on the Earth, which it, they don't realize it's the Earth when they get there, but it crash lands and the people who survive come out and start setting up a society, which mm -hmm. is, um, you know, absurdly bureaucratic and, and just silly. And yeah. they, they do, they discover that this is uh, the origin of, the human population of the earth they are actually <laughs> descended from all these hairdressers and account executives and other like middlemen type bureaucratic type people. Yeah. And meanwhile, Ford, Ford and, or sorry, Zaphod and Trillian end up meeting the man who controls the galaxy. who is just some crazy oh, guy in a, in a shack right. who just is sort of basically stuck on the cogito. You know, he's like, D does anything really exist? I don't know. I seem to have it's feelings, but lovely. that catch is lovely. He, he knows that he exists, that he is in a, in a shack, and that he has a cat. He doesn't know anything else, and he has no permanence of most anything else. He's like the perfect, I don't know, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'd say Well, that it's there. like your idea that when you go beyond, when you're post-dent, you're sort of crazy. You're, you're yeah. wise and insane at the same time, right? That you can't be both. Right, right. And, and it is funny that he is the most powerful person in the entire universe. And I don't know if they really get into this, but I think the reason that he was chosen is because he's the one that will abuse that position the least. Right, because he doesn't really have any motivation to abuse it. So right, it's just, right. but, but that, that makes, but in a way though, he's kind of a random number generator. <laughs> yeah. Right? So well, that, that's... Just more irony layered, layered on there. 
but it, that that goes perfectly together with the the theme of oh yeah the galaxy and in general all of existence is the random at the heart of it like there's yeah. no meaning it just happens yeah um, it's absurd it doesn't it doesn't really make any sense it, yeah. but it somehow it all fits together anyway yeah so anyway they that book ends and this is the end of the i think the end of the radio series um style the mm -hmm. book ends with Zaphon Trillian going off in the Heart of Gold and Ford and Arthur becoming resigned to just living on this planet, the prehistoric Earth, finding some cute ex-hairdressers or whatever, and uh, <laughs> settling down. Yeah, I think next up is, um, I don't know if it was in this book, but there's also a critique of like economy <laughs> based on the leaves. Uh, the, oh, made oh. I think you're right. I think that was in that book. At the end of the book, the, right, the, the joke about they've declared the leaf their currency, and so now they've just, and then there's an inflation problem. So they've yeah. decided to solve it by burning down all the forests, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, to create an artificial scarcity of leaves. Yeah, but there's a lot of stuff like that, a lot of satire of uh, human stupidity and, and <laughs> yeah. bureaucracy and all that. Yeah. Okay, so. There's a lot more to go through, so maybe we should end this now and do another one on the other books. Okay. The the remaining three books. Uh, yeah. What do you say? Does that sound like a plan? That or? sounds perfectly fine by me. Okay. Cool.